do want us to think about how that we need to, and this is a good time for it, to make commitments that can and will change our spiritual lives if we'll let it. Sometimes we have a tendency to avoid certain aspects of living our Christian life. It's, you know, it just seems like it's too difficult, it's too hard, or there's fear or something. And sometimes we, we are kind of like little Johnny who had trouble pronouncing the letter R. He just, he just couldn't get it out. He couldn't say the letter R. So his teacher thought he would, she would uh, help him out. And uh, so she gave him a sentence. And I said, she said, I want you to take this sentence home. And I want you to say it, repeat it, say it, repeat it. And uh, it was already on the sentence. Uh, nope. Well, where'd my sentence go? There it is. And so she uh, said, I want you to say, and over and over again, so you can learn to pronounce your R's, Robert gave Richard a rap in the rib, ribs to, for roasting the rabbit so rare. And work on it, work on it, work on it. Well, after a period of time, she said, how's, how's, your, how's your sentence going? He said, oh, I say it perfectly. She said, you do? So you kind of, you, you really conquered that? And he said, yeah. And said, well, say it for me. And so he said, Bob gave Dick a poke in the side for not cooking the bunny enough. <laughs> Well, sometimes we're kind of like that, aren't we? I mean, we, we, we uh, just can't, we, we avoid things. We avoid, Johnny did all he could to avoid the letter R. And many of us, are, at times, we can do the same thing when it comes to trying to respond to these messages about the commitment that we need to make for Christ and the service that we need to be in. And so Jesus' whole ministry, though, Jesus' whole message uh, was that the church, us, you and me, uh, are to be the ones who are to serve one another. And those who are not only in the church, those are very important, but he even expanded it to go outside of the body, to serve one another in the world. Over in Matthew 20, down to the 25th verse and following, was that the one I had before? I can't remember. No, that was last week. That's why it's up there. I forgot to take it off. You'd think I would be better at this. Uh, Matthew 20. We find Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to, but to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. Jesus is speaking to people who previously didn't have even the vaguest idea of what it meant to serve one another. They lived in a society, we think our society, we think our world today is selfish. We think, we think our world today is, is really uh, uh, built upon the materialistic and, and the carnal things in life. But back in the day, when Jesus was saying this word, the, the common culture of the day was one that a society that was very, very self-serving. There was class systems that were very, very self-serving. And even among the Jews, there were class systems And when Jesus came upon the scene. And that's why he, he so many times came down on the Jewish leaders so hard, was because they did not value life equally. There were those who didn't, they didn't value their life at all uh, as being of anything of significance. But Jesus came on the scene in that setting, and he turned culture ideas completely upside down. So in this passage, he tells them, as he had done many times before, that the first will be last and the last will be first. The Apostle Peter would later put it this way. He said in uh, 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. You want to know how to cover a multitude of sins? Love deeply. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. <laughs> like they attach they that to it, you know. Don't just offer hospitality. Offer it without grumbling. 
Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithful, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. In this passage Peter, of Peter, we find, I think, the elements of what it takes to be a Christian servant. I think we see the elements that, that have to be there in order to be a Christian servant. Because he said, first of all, in that passage, he said, you need, we need to love. He said in that eighth verse, he said, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply. In, in the church, we spend a lot of time talking about love. Uh, and we sing a lot about love in our, in our text. And, and it should be, because since loving one another is the second greatest commandment, because we know Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your strength and all your heart and all your mind. But then he said the second is to love one another, just as you would love yourself. But how many times do we really practice that? I think the main problem is that we don't fully realize what Jesus meant when he was saying these words, when he was saying to love one another. And he, because, you see, he issued that as a command. How do you command somebody to love? If all that love is, you can't, you can't command somebody to fall in love. You know, we say all the time, well, I fell in love. Well, what'd you trip over? Uh, you know, I mean, what do you mean you fell in love? Well, there had to be, you know, what I'm saying is, is some kind of emotion spurred me or sparked me. And I thought it was love. Actual love, though, goes farther and deeper than just that emotion. And we see loving one another is a decision. It's an act in service to others, even if they may be your enemy. So even Jesus said, love your enemies. Uh, one man noted, he said, he who loves always does much. And he who loved little, he, he who loves much always does much. And he who loved little will do little. Jesus put it this way, you'll know them by their fruits. In other words, love can be seen through what you do, what your actions. We know, I think all probably know the fruits of the Spirit found over in Galatians, where it says, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I've always felt like that isn't an uh, exhausted list. I don't think that's an exclusive list to say, well, I've done all those, so I'm good. You know, it's kind of like the rich young ruler that said, you know, I've kept all the laws, so I'm good. What he's saying is, because he says, things such as this... Things just like this, there is no law, but these things should exist. Notice that the fruit of the Spirit begins, though, with love. Here, some time back, I was, I was looking at, at a discussion on the fruit of the Spirit, and I never thought of it this way. I thought of it as, well, you've got love as one of those entities. But I think the writer had it right when he said, you've got love, and this is how love is manifested. This is how you know that a person has love. If they've got joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Someone said these eight then all hang up on that one. Uh, joy is love exalting. Peace is love in repose. Long-suffering or, or patience is love on trial. Gentleness is love in our society. Goodness is love in action. Faith is love on the battlefield. Meekness is love at school. And temperance is love in training. So it is love all the way. Love the, at top. Love at the bottom all the way through. It's all embedded in that. That's what Paul said in the Corinthian letter when we got the love chapter of the Bible. He said, unless you have love, all this other stuff means nothing. Everything you do in the church, everything you do in life, everything you do for one another means nothing if it's not with love. The guy who doesn't do anything for others can talk about love all day long, but it means nothing to God. Over in 1 John, that love book of the Bible, we're all familiar with that, I think. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother, and he, I, I, like, I like how John and James both just really got down to practical, down to, to street level, if you will, language. You can't miss it. If anyone has material possessions, if anybody's got anything, 
let's face it, we all have material possessions, and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can that love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions in truth. And you can't put it any more plain than that. What is it that should motivate us as Christians to serve one another? Our love for one another, just as Jesus has loved us. And that is the most important aspect and even the motivation of serving. Because if it's not there, it'll be very difficult to serve one another. And that's what will lead us to the, the also in that Peter passage we were reading earlier over in 1 Peter 4, 9, where he tells us and shows us the second thing there that he talks about, that we have love through showing hospitality. And offer, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Well, it changed, the, the word hospitality has changed. Uh, the dictionary actually puts it this way as a definition. Hospitality is the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. Well, that's right. I'm not going to say it's not accurate, but it go, does not even come close to what this word means in the text. Uh, the word ha cha has changed now somewhat since the first century. To show hospitality in this day and age, and what he's talking about in this passage, and by the way, uh, get out your concordance sometime and look and see how many times hospitality is talked about. It's a lot in the Bible. We see that, that the word in the Bible is often talking about about taking people, even strangers sometimes, into your home and giving them everything they need to, to live and survive and to care for them. Uh, that's the kind of hospitality he's talking about here. We have dec de decreased the meaning today to be polite. You know, be polite to one another. That's that's kind of, you know, don't don't say anything that isn't polite. Uh, and we say that's being hospitable. But if you will notice, the root portion of the word hospitality is hospital. That's because that word has always meant you take them in and you care for them. Just like the, why it's called a hospital. And uh, it's, it's, it's in that thinking, in that mode of thinking, that we find that, that we are called to be uh, ones of hospitality. One of the best examples, I think, in scriptures of this is has got to be the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, of course, was an enemy. The Samaritans were enemies of the Jews. And the Samaritan, uh, you know, came along to the Jew that had been beaten and robbed and was laying, bleeding, and dying in the ditch. And we all know the story. And uh, he, he, uh, we had the two, we had, by the way, the one by accident that Jesus used two religious leaders <laughs> passed him by, one a Levite and then one a priest. And they passed him by. They saw him. They didn't miss him. They even went on the other side of the road to, to avoid him, and they passed him by. Of their own Jewish, you know, people. But then the Samaritan, an enemy, came along, and he took care of him. He, he tended his wounds. He put him on his donkey. He took him to an inn. He took him in. He says, I want you to care for him. It cost anything. I'll pay for it. So not only was he a stranger, he was an enemy. Uh, to those people, and yet that is the example, greatest example I can think of in the scriptures of hospitality. Uh, and we see uh, Peter told us in, in uh, 1 Peter 4.10, he said, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Everybody needs to use the gifts that you have that's to serve others. Do you know what those are? Well, that actually leads us to the third thing that the Peter passage said was, was, was there that we all have gifts. Again, we talk about this quite often. We've talked about it quite a bit last year in our, our series that we went through in the I Am and I Will uh, series. And, and uh, we know that uh, we all have gifts. Uh, some people don't think so, though. Some people say, well, I, I, I can't do much. I don't think I do much or can do much. Uh, you know, but all of us, according to the scriptures, have been given something. Sometimes we don't recognize them because they've not been used. 
They've not been developed. Sometimes we don't count them as gifts of God because we think that we have somehow achieved uh, something upon our own. And they didn't have anything to do with God. I did this. I, I learned this. I went to school for this. I, I, I'm the reason why I have this gift. In that wonderful passage of Romans 12 I shared with you last week, and again, I said this last week, but I want to share it with I want you to urge to, to you today to read it. That's your, another, again, your assignment if you haven't done it. Read Romans chapter 12. Read Romans, but mainly chapter 12 for now. Because we find more of an explanation about the body life of the church. And that 12th chapter is one of the best in there explaining the body life of the church. And uh, uh, it, it, as we see the gifts of God were given to us to function in the body. Let's look at that. And I'm going to read a pretty good portion of that. This is just 6 through 16, but read the whole chapter yourselves. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. Everybody. Nobody's excluded. If a man's gift or a woman's gift is prophesying, of course, that could be teaching. I mean, that's the same thing of what we might think of teaching instead of predicting the future, what some of them had that ability supernaturally back in that day, but that's not what he's referring to here. Let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, do you ever realize that's a gift, that you can encourage one another? And we need encouraged. We all need to be encouraged. They encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, you, you've got the means that you can contribute to the needs of others, let them give generously. If it is leadership, let them govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let them do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. If it's not, it's not going to work. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted one to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. That's a tough one. <laughs> How many of you are lacking in zeal? Usually when I get up in the morning, I'm lacking in zeal. You know, I mean, it's not just talking about energy here. It's the inner, inner desire. The inner desire to do. The inner desire to serve. It's not just, you know, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm, you know, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you have a burning desire inside to serve. So don't never be lacking in that. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. There we are again. Bless those who persecute you. Now it's getting tough. Really getting tough. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Again, that don't mean the same to us as it did then. I mean, we're talking in that day and age when this was written, we're talking about associating with low position would be the ultimate no-no. I don't know how else to put it. Associate with low, people of low position and do not be conceited. That means not thinking that you're better than others. And read the whole chapter because this was, and again I shared the later portion with you last week. And uh, we see that Paul repeated this over in 1 Corinthians 12. So this is another 12th chapter I'd like for you to read, 1 Corinthians 12. But in that chapter he said there are different kinds of gifts. Everybody's got gifts. There are different kinds of gifts. But we all have the same spirit where the gifts come from. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works all of them in all men. Of course, men is used in a, a general mankind sense, men and women. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Everybody. That is a child of God, a Christian, you have the manifestation of the Spirit given to you for the common good of all people. 
So that's why our gifts are so important. How can we know what abilities that we individually have? How, how can we know? First of all, I think the important first step always is to pray. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to help you to know. Ask the Lord to help you to understand. Ask the Lord to help you to see clearly your gifts and how to use them. So first of all, we need to pray about it and think about what it is so that we can do it with our gifts uh, to serve the Lord. And then don't be afraid to get feedback from others. Sometimes the Lord answers through others. Sometimes the Lord will, will use that individual that's come into your life and, and uh, may be in your life and somebody that uh, has the words that you need to listen to to encourage you to understand uh, what it is that are your gifts in life. Sometimes people will see and point out your gifts that you cannot see. You might try out some ways of serving God by volunteering. We've been talking about this for the past three Sundays and uh, quite a bit, and starting with William's message and, and going on from there. And we do have some who are volunteering now. And I pray, appreciate that, but I encourage more of this to try out stuff. Try it. See what it's like. See if, see if maybe this is the gifts that God has given you. And it just doesn't have to be a teaching class or anything like that. There's all kinds of avenues that you can try it. Sometimes we let all of the what ifs stop us from trying it. What if I can't do it and I fail? What if I don't like doing it? Will that be wrong if I don't like doing it? What if, and then you got to fill in your own blank there, what if? Last Sunday we enjoyed another lesson from Andy Stanley in our Sunday school morning class, and this morning too, because he carried along the same lesson. And, and in that lesson series that we're looking at, he asked one very important question that can be the catalyst to lead us into a certain realm of serving the Lord. He says that where we need to actually start is with this question. What is it that breaks your heart? What is it in the world that breaks your heart? What is it in the church that breaks your heart? In the home? Think about that and then let that question lead you to an answer that could put you in the service of God and call you to answer what is breaking your heart. Why is it breaking your heart? If nothing whatsoever ever breaks your heart, then I'm concerned about your heart. The Bible calls that a hardness of heart if it's not penetrated. And something, something, there's a lot in this world that should break your heart. A lot. What, you, what, what can we do about that? So, when you seriously think about this question, you're going to come up with some answers. And once you find out, at least get an idea of what you think you are concerned with, you are interested in. You can find out where your gifts fit into the church, into society, into life, into the home. Too many will stand back and say, you know, be, be ask, you know, I'll, I'll do anything you want me to do, but you got to ask me. You got to ask me first. You know, I'm not going to step out and volunteer for it. <laughs> I guarantee you that. Well, well, is that it? Is that the right attitude? The great missionary Charles Kings Kingsley once said, have your tools ready and God will find you work to do. Someone else once said, look for a need and you will always find it. I like the wisdom of Solomon. Where Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave... Where you are going, we're all going there someday, if we aren't fortunate enough to see Jesus come again in the, in the, in the sky. Where you're going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. It's all over. It, now is the time. Today is the day that we need to, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Do it. Today I'd like to inspire you 
to make a commitment to serve and start wherever you are right now. Everybody's somewhere. Wherever you are right now, the important thing is, is we need to all be serving. Serving the Lord in some way, shape, or form. Faithfully, continually, through a heart of love. We have been given a new year, and every time we get a new year, things kind of seem to be new. <laughs> we got, it really is kind of a clean slate thing. And so it's a good time to say, okay, yes, I want, I, I, you know, I, I want to, you know, grow. I want to be more spiritual. I want to be able to be more what the Lord wants me to be. And we will be if we have that attitude. Listen to the words of this little article called I Am the New Year. I am the new year. I come to you unstained, untarnished by regrets and lost opportunities. I am fresh, and I give you a chance to begin again. I am made up with time, and when it is gone, I will never return again because I have only been appointed once to appear. Some will use me wisely, while others will let me slip quietly past, never realizing my true value. Use me wisely as a good steward of what God has given you. My happiness depends upon your wisdom, for I cannot come again. Carefully divide me between friends, family, yourself, and the Lord. But be sure to make the proportions proper and pleasing to God, serving Him fully. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. It's invitation time. And I want to invite you in this new year to commit yourself to service. Find whatever it is that God has given you in the form of gifts to be able to serve Him. I've shared this with you several times before, but it always pops in mind when I have a message like this and get in this discussion. And, and there, most of you will know, because, but some of you may not, but uh, we had a wonderful couple here in the church for years and years, uh, Eugene Vermey Keith. And uh, Eugene was, was unique, how's to put it? <laughs> wonderful man. And uh, Vermey was unique in a different way, but still a wonderful Christian. And uh, one day I was talking to Vera May, and she was so concerned. You talk about having a broken heart, having a heart for people, having a heart for things going on. She worried way too much, I thought. But it led her to be one of the best prayer partners I've ever known. She was always praying for you. Not just me as a preacher, everybody. She wanted to know what was going on with everybody. She wanted to know what, what she could pray for. And she told me one time, and I never forgot it, she says, I can't do much in the church, and I, but I can pray. And I believe that she had the gift of prayer. That was her gift. She was a tremendous prayer. You see, we all have gifts. And it's just a matter of realizing where our heart lies. In love serve one another because that is what we're called to do. I invite everybody to do that at this time. Make a commitment to serve as we start this new year but if there is a decision you need to make or help you need we sure encourage you to come and let us share with you encourage one another or go to that person that you trust and always share with one another. Shall we stand as we sing?